Hello, I'm Wolfgang Lutz. I'm a demographer studying world population trends. Many people think that the world population will continue to grow at the same speed as it did for the past decades and that it will cause serious problems ranging from food supply to poverty and environmental degradation. But few people seem to know that we now see the end of world population growth on the horizon. And the ASA research has clearly shown that what is the single most important factor in slowing population growth and solving many of the other related problems, guess what it is? It is the education of girls, universal primary and secondary education for all young women on this planet. Let's have a look at the long term world population trend. Until about the 18th, 19th century, there was less than half a billion people on this planet, fewer people than we have now in Europe. It was then in the 19th century that the death rate started to fall. People survived famines, there was hygienic uh, health measures, so more people survived, but the birth rate was still high, and this is why the population started to grow, first in Europe and then outside Europe. So by the middle of the 20th century, the mortality decline has reached today's developing countries. And this was the time where the world population growth really started to take off. And as you see on this chart, we are now above 7 billion people. And it's quite unclear where it will go into the future. Here you see a probabilistic world population projection for the 21st century. At the moment, we are about 7.2 billion and depending on what is the future trend in fertility in different parts of the world, it will most likely peak around 9, 9.2 billion people and then slowly start to decline. But you see this broad range. If fertility continues to be high, we may be reaching 12 billion. If it declines faster, it may be lower by the end of the century than it is today. And the world is very heterogeneous. Here you see Sub-Saharan Africa, a very likely doubling, if not tripling, of the population there because the birth rates are still very high in Africa. The contrary is in Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe, we see a near certain decline in population size because the population is already very old and the birth rate is very low and people leave those countries to a larger extent. So there is shrinking, almost certainly pre-programmed in Eastern Europe. But the main driver clearly, as I mentioned, is girls' education. Here you see for some selected developing countries, the birth rates by the mother's level of education. So the red bar shows you the number of children that women have without any formal education. The orange one if they have some primary education and the blue one if they have some secondary or higher education. And in every country of the world, the more educated women have clearly fewer children because they want fewer children and they find ways to control their family size. Just look at Ethiopia here in 2005. Uneducated women have on average six children. If they have already some secondary education, they only have two children on average. So that's a major driver towards low fertility. And we had recently a review article in Science magazine that puts these things together and simulates what would happen if identical fertility rates are assumed, but we have different scenarios in terms of female education. Because uh, female education is the single most important driver of also child survival, health, and uh, the level of fertility. So if we assume identical education-specific fertility rates, we first have a scenario that we call the constant education numbers, same scenario, that assumes that no new schools are being built. The number of students in school is not increasing. And as you see here uh, the, uh, on the right-hand side, the red means the uneducated people in the, on the planet, the yellow those with some primary education, the light blue those with some secondary, and the dark blue with tertiary education. So you see an expansion of the less educated and the world population may even increase to 10 billion under this very low education scenario. Now we have the most optimistic scenario that we call the fast track that assumes that countries expand their education at the same speed that South Korea managed to do this. And you see the picture on the right looks quite different. There are many more highly educated women, 
and because those women have fewer children, world population will be only 9 billion, so 1 billion less, simply due to better education of women and already by the middle of the century. Now let's step back and talk about this concept of human capital. Uh, of course it requires people, so it's the number of people, the population, but it's their education and it's their health. These are all elements that form human capital. Uh, the easiest to measure is education. Of course, there are all kinds of health indicators, but they are much more subjective. And in education, again, you have formal education and informal education. Here in our modeling, we mostly focus on the formal education and on the quantity. As you all know, quality of education matters a lot too, and the content, what you learn in school. But let's now just focus on the quantity of formal education. And here we usually matter measure education flows, which is the policy variables, how many people, how many girls of a given cohort population are in school. This is measured through the gross and net enrollment rates. But when we want to measure human capital, we are interested in the stocks. And stocks, as you know, change very slowly. They have great momentum. And that stocks is what is the average education of the adult population that's already out of school. And that can be measured in terms of the mean years of schooling for the adult population. And what we'll be looking now on, the distribution by highest educational attainment groups and age. And then, of course, the stocks can also be measured through functional literacy, such as a recent OECD study has shown. Now let's look at the Republic of Korea, South Korea, which in 1970 was still a poor developing country. You see in red, this means the women above age 35, the large majority has never been to school. This is because in the 50s and 60s, Korea was a desperately poor country without a developed school system. Only then in the late 60s, schooling had started. And by 1970, you see uh, that the young cohorts, the young age groups, to a large extent, have received primary and even secondary education. Now we go on in time. 1980, we see now the young generation is already much better educated. You see the blue area moving from the bottom upwards. That's what we call demographic metabolism. That is the way how societies change along generation lines. And when these better educated people, like here in 1990, move up into the main working ages, this is when rapid economic growth is being experienced. And you may know that Korea, one of the Asian tigers, really had their most rapid growth exactly during these periods when the better educated young adults uh, moved into responsible positions. 2000. 2010. You still have a few uneducated elderly. Those were there above school age in the 1950s, and they are now above the age of 65. But look at the young generation now. More than half of young women in Korea have already completed tertiary education. These are the best educated young women in the world. So it's a very, very rapid change in educational attainment. And if you look at the shape of the pyramid, you see that women in Korea have very few children. Uh, partly because the highly educated women are more working in the, in the labor force and uh, they can have difficulties combining work and family. So the birth rate in Korea is extremely low. And in 2030, that is the age pyramid that we are projecting, very high levels of education about a very old society. And here the key question is, how can this better educated young people compensate for their smaller number in terms of economic productivity. But there are many other consequences of education. Let's look at health. What you see here is for our country, Austria, you see the disability rates uh, measured as the limitations in activities of daily life. The red line is again the lowest education category in Austria and the blue line, those with university education. You see that women, let's look at the age group 75 to 79 years old. If they have a university degree, they're only half as likely to be disabled than those who are of the lowest educational category. So almost universal in the world, and we could see this for many countries, the better educated people are not only more productive throughout their life, but they're also in a better health status decades after they went to school, when they are in their 70s or 80s. 
And this really changes the view that we look to the future. There is a lot of concern that due to population aging and the fact that elderly people are more disabled, we see an avalanche of disability coming on us. And in a way, this purple line shows for Asia, if we only assume that there is going to be more elderly people in the future and the elderly are more disabled, we will see this increase in the ADLs, which is the disability measure. But once you factor in education, namely that, as we've seen, the future elderly will be better educated and better educated elderly will be lo lower degree disabled, then the future looks much better. Actually, there is going to be a decline in the disability rate of the 30 to 74 year olds. So again, if you factor in education explicitly into the model, the future looks different and typically it looks more positive. The same is true for Western Europe, also here a significant reduction in the disability. So let's step back and see what is this education effect. Is it a real effect or is it something artificial? I think we have good reasons to assume what I call functional causality from education to health and income. This is something that this relationship is really causal and it will hold to be causal in the future. So education is not just a proxy for socioeconomic status, maybe reflecting income or other things. So what is it really that education makes to our brains, to our behavior? Cognitive science and neuroscience has shown us very clearly that every learning experience builds new synapses in our brains. It makes us physiologically different. As famously Eric Kandel has said, who got in the year 2000 here the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for his work in brain research. So enhancing of the cognitive skills is a consequence of education. And we can show that more educated people change their behavior towards less risky behavior. We also extend our personal planning horizon. We look further into the future in terms of the consequences of our actions. And very importantly, we are faster in learning from past damage. So the, so the learning curve is steeper. And we have better access to relevant information. If we can read and write, of course, we can acquire more information. Improvement of the health and physical well-being, or in terms of the living environment that we can structure. We are more empowered to do things the way we want to do them. And of course, higher income at the individual and at the household level is also a result of better education. And that also helps us uh, to get better food supply or a healthier living environment. So these are all mechanisms by which education directly influences our well-being. And with this new education and age-specific uh, data, we could finally also resolve a puzzle that uh, development economists have long struggled with. Namely, that theory tells you that human capital, that education, should be a key driver of economic development. But in the actual data, the time series from many countries, that did not consistently find such results. Because what they've done is they took the mean years of schooling of the entire adult population. So if you remember the Korean age pyramid, you had these very highly educated young people and the uneducated elderly in the same society at the same point in time. Now, if you average their education, you get some average level which has very little statistical signal. It is not closely associated with rates of economic growth. But if you do it in an age-specific way and look at the educational improvement from year to year of the young adults, then you very clearly uh, see this strong association. So we could establish uh, that uh, education indeed is a consistent driver of economic growth. And moreover, we could show that complementing primary education with universal secondary education is the most important factor for poor countries to come out of poverty. So this picture here is China, which has seen one of the world's most impressive poverty eradication over the past decades. And you just see how this blue area, the area of the more educated, greatly expanded, which I believe was the key driver of the Chinese economic success story. But there are many other important consequences of education. We just completed a major comparative project on the relationship between disaster death and education around the world. And this is a relationship that disaster research community hasn't really studied so far. 
But if you look at the relationship between the education, both at the individual level as well as at the community and national level, and the vulnerability, the deaths due to disasters, you see a very strong relationship as here given by this red line. And we did a case study of three countries that are in the same region in the Caribbean. They are exposed to the same natural hazards through hurricanes. So the same hurricane comes about Cuba, and Cuba, a few people are typically injured. Then it goes on to the Dominican Republic and Haiti. And there, in the Dominican Republic, you typically have a bigger damage. Also, the country is richer than Cuba, but somewhat less educated. And Haiti is the worst. It's usually a disaster with thousands of deaths. The same hurricane where Cuba is a very highly educated, well-organized, but still income-wise poor society, has very few fatalities, and Haiti is the worst. So you see this very much uh, reinforcing the point that education is a key protecting factor to uh, natural disaster vulnerability. We also had a series of papers looking at education and the quality of governance. Here you see an indicator of modern democracy, uh, the Freedom House indicator of uh, democratic freedoms. And again, you see a very strong association. The higher educated the population is, the greater the probability that the citizens will exert the checks and balances on power that will lead eventually to a more democratic regime. Uh, of course, it's not automatic. There are all kind of path dependencies. And we look at the interesting specific case of Iran, uh, where we make the quite courageous uh, prediction that based on the global level association and Iran's rapid improvement in education, there's a high chance that Iran will soon move into the direction of a modern democratic society. Of course, there's no certainty, and we can't say when it will happen. But it's a high chance. Finally, let's come to the very complex issue of global climate change and human population. Uh, there's been lots of research in this field, and uh, we know that we, the humans, are the main uh, drivers of CO2 emissions and other degradation of the environment that will lead to global climate change. But also we know that the solutions need to come from us either through change in behavior or through technological innovations. So it's again us, but not just the number of people, the skills of the people that matters for the innovation, for the uh, changes in technology, and that what we call mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions. So that is how we cause climate change and possibly in the future still can curb our emissions so there will be less climate change. But there already is inevitable climate change. So the human well-being, the human populations will be affected by climate change. And here again, it is important to look at what we call demographic differential vulnerability. It means in an area that is affected by climate change, let's say by flooding or by storms or by sea level rise, not every person, not every household in that region is equally affected. We can see that young people and the elderly tend to be more affected. Women tend to be more affected than men. And importantly, as I showed, less educated people tend to be more vulnerable than more educated. So this is a field where demographers now uh, are focusing the attention on uh, the effects of global climate change on human well-being in terms of differential vulnerability. Uh, I want to conclude with a new effort for translating these new insights uh, into new global level scenarios. As you may know, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Research Community, has been for long operating with the so-called stress scenarios, which were developed around 2000 by a group here at YASA. But they were relatively parsimonious with respect to the socioeconomic factors. They only had total population size and GDP. So the population served as a denominator for per capita emissions or whatever. Now a new generation of scenarios has been created that we call the SSPs, the Shared Socioeconomic Pathways. And here we have a much more elaborate, what we call human core. So we have populations structured by age, sex, and level of education. And they are built in consistent scenarios with urban rural place of residence and future GDP growth. So we have a much richer set and that the core 
It is this new insight that education is seen as the single most important source of observable population heterogeneity next to age and sex. And education is a good, stable and consistent indicator of empowerment and of social status. Now, this is the matrix of the SSPs where we have on the one axis socioeconomic challenges for adaptation of climate change and on the other socioeconomic challenges for mitigation. And then we have sort of three uh, development uh, scenarios that have the SSP1 to SSP3 sort of show the development diagonal. And this is the most likely world. It's the SSP2. It's sort of the middle of the road scenario uh, where we see the world population, as I said before, peaking at somewhat above 9 billion. But you also see that the average education of the world improves greatly over time. There's going to be many more with secondary and tertiary education. And the bottom billion of the uneducated people will diminish over time. So that's a fairly optimistic middle of the road scenario. There can be a pessimistic scenario if education stagnates and fertility rates continue to be fairly high in Africa. You see the world population going up to 12 billion and the education of the, the bottom billion actually increasing to 2 billion and there is a sizable uneducated and therefore also poor and unhealthy population. So this is a non-sustainable future. And then on the other extreme, the scenario called sustainable development, but the fertility decline is even more rapid than in the average case, where there are more education efforts. Here you see the world population grow peaking even before reaching 9 billion. And by the end of the century, it may be lower than it is today. And it is a much, much better educated population than it is today on a global level. And giving all these benefits of education that I've talked about, this is really the future world that I want to live in and that I want to see my children live in. Thank you.